1, 2, and 3. You can turn in your books to 429 or that's the words up there as well. So either way, I don't care. 1, 2, and 3 of 4, 2, 9. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe, forward into battle, see his banner go. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. I'm not one to lecture usually, but man, I can barely hear you tonight. You all asleep out there? I know it is a little bit of a lower register song and sometimes that doesn't carry, but I feel like I'm singing a solo and you don't want that. The best solo I sing is so low you can't hear me. And my favorite place to sing is on a hill far away, right? So, uh, boy, sing it out, participate. You'll, you'll be grateful you did. Verse number two. At the sign of triumph. Oh, that's more like it. The flee. On then Christian soldiers unto victory. Hell's foundations Shout a praise, brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Like a mighty Nice job, nice singing tonight. Boy, I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We went all the way down to Douglasville, Georgia, which is just west of Atlanta, and spent the week down there. 12-hour drive there and back. It's a bit taxing. My family won't even offer to help drive. No, that's not true. I just won't let them drive. I know there's something about driving through the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee and thinking that Winston has the wheel in his hand that just doesn't sit right with me. But we had a wonderful time. Let me ask you, pray for a gentleman named Gerald Claxton. He's an old friend of mine. Uh, we, we've known each other, goodness, for over uh, 20 years now. He used to drive a bus for me when I was the bus director there at the church, and he'd go into Atlanta and pick up the mission men. And he was a professional driver, and he also spent time in the Army as a young man. But he lost his wife about two months ago to cancer, and tomorrow would be their 65th wedding anniversary. And I told you this morning, but Gerald's just a big old guy, as strong as an ox, and, and honestly, I'm surprised that the Lord's given him this much time. You'd think that uh, given his size, he might even have, have passed by now, had a heart attack or something like that, but the Lord's kept him around, but boy, he was just broken when we talked to him. And uh, not the kind of guy to get emotional, but two or three times just broke down, sobbing because of uh, the pain he's feeling over the loss of his wife. And I don't know if I should say this publicly, but he even said that, you know, he just doesn't even want to go on himself anymore. And I hope you'd pray for him. Gerald Claxton, especially tomorrow. Tomorrow will be the anniversary date, 
and uh, 65 years. Can you imagine that? And so I just I hope you'd pray and, and ask the Lord to comfort him and help him through that time. We made sure he was taken care of at Thanksgiving. He's got some other kids in the area and so forth. But my heart just broke for him that night. But I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and we did also. Got to see Shannon's family, her parents and uh, siblings and all the nieces and nephews and uh, turkey, mashed potatoes, buttered rolls, what do you like, the, sh the stuffing as well, yeah. And then she makes some sort of weird, uh, some, some dip. It's called a million dollar dip. Million dollar dip. And it looked like it had everything from the kitchen sink. Like they scooped their hand in the kitchen sink drain, threw it on a plate, and everybody dipped into it. It's just not my type of thing, that's for sure. All right, Shireen was asking me today, what do you like to eat anyways? I said, well, uh, wood, styrofoam, pizza. That's about it. And so speaking of pizza, Ashley and Bubba are back there from Domino's. You don't know how much they've helped this church and the people in our community through us. Uh, first off, last fall when we had pizza after the Sunday morning service, it was Domino's. Ashley was behind all of that and Bubba helps run things down there up the street uh, for them. And what they've been doing recently is they've been raising uh, canned goods and, and having a canned good drive and they're giving us all of the canned goods that they receive so that we can get them out to the families that we serve on the bus routes and different things like that. So appreciate you two very, very much in the work that you're doing and the heart you have uh, for, for our ministry and what we're trying to get done too. So praise the Lord. And they're a pizza shop on top of it. How can it get any better than that? All right, let's go ahead and pray and, and we'll uh, get things going. Father, we love you. Thank you for our guests and their heart and, and the love they have for this area and the people in it. Uh, thank you for letting them help us. I pray that you put your hand a blessing on them and uh, their work there as they serve our area and bless that business, help them to keep doing well, even in spite of the, the difficulties we've had here with the coronavirus going on. I do pray for Gerald tonight, and I ask that you give him a good day tomorrow. I wonder how that will be possible, seeing as how hard he's taking this. And he tells us he has good days and bad days. And Lord, I pray that you'd give him a good one tomorrow. May he not uh, feel the sting and the pain, but maybe look forward to seeing her again and looking fondly back on all the memories that they had, all the service that they accomplished for you together. Just bless that dear man, please. Let his family rally around him tomorrow and help him through the day. I pray your blessing on our teenagers here tonight. Thank you for their hearts for you. And just everybody, as we assemble together, would you speak to us, work in our lives, help us to leave here stronger, better Christians and servants for you. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Let's turn now to 480. I want that mountain. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of 4, 8, 0. I saw the giant of prayerlessness upon the mountain high. He laughed so hard at my unbended knee. No longer in the wilderness I'll stay and so I cry. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eskel grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. Verse 2. There was a giant of laziness who said I wouldn't go and witness for the one who set me free. I'll come from out the wilderness, I'll witness now I know. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain where the Verse 
number four. Let every giant of distress and unbelief and sin get ready now to vacate for you see. I've come from out the wilderness. I know I'm going to win. I want that mountain. It belongs to me. I want that mountain. I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Escobar grow, I want that mountain. I want that mountain, the mountain that my Lord has given me. Of course, that song's written about Caleb and Joshua, isn't it? They went across the Jordan with the other ten men, spying out the land to decide uh, what to do about heading over and how to approach it. And when they came back, 10 of those 12 men said, you know what, we're not going. The giants are too big and, and the cities are too strong and we just don't think we can do it. But Caleb and Joshua said, you know what, we want to go over there. And God's already promised he'd give us the victory and we want that mountain. Amen. It's a good song. Number 215 for our final song this evening. My Jesus, I love thee. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of 2, 1, 5. My Jesus, I love thee. tonight. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of James, will you please? James chapter number one is where we'll find our message tonight. Go toward the back of your New Testament. If you can find the book of Hebrews, you're warm. Go all the way to the end of the book of Hebrews and you'll find James is the very next book. James chapter one, we're going to be reading verses 19 through 27 tonight. James 1, verses 19 through 27. I'll read aloud. You just follow along quietly. If you don't happen to have a Bible, Scripture will be up on the wall as well. James chapter 1, starting in verse number 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. 
Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, he deceiveth, I'm sorry, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let's pray together, please. Father, help us as we look into this book both in this passage and one other, as we discuss this matter of bridling our tongues, would you help us? We know how serious a matter it is, and we also know how difficult a matter it is. But I pray tonight you'd give us some insight, some wisdom, and some growth in this area, please. We love you tonight, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Years ago, our family took the vacation of a lifetime, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, We had never, ever taken a vacation over five days in length. Of course, being here the last 17 years, pastoring a church, it's hard to get away for any length of time, let alone for for more than, than five days, having missing weekends and so forth. But I said, you know, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to bite the bullet. We're going to take a two-week vacation. And we're going to get in the car and we're going to head west. And we're going to go all the way to Yellowstone National Park. And we hit a lot of different things along the way. Uh, first, we hit Connie's Pizza, downtown Chicago, Chinatown, right? Uh, you got you to gotta go to Connie's at some point in your life. And uh, that was our first stop on the trip. We got it off on the right foot. And then we kept on going through Illinois and made our way up into southern Wisconsin and then headed over into southern Minnesota. And I uh, forget what we did. We did something in Minnesota. And then we cruised on through. And as soon as we left Minnesota, we got to South Dakota and we saw the Ingalls Homestead, you know, Little House on the Prairie and all that stuff. And uh, the, the homestead where they lived when Laura Ingalls Wilders was in, in you know, her latter adolescent years and, and much of her teenage years. We saw their first little house in that area, and all it was was a cutout. There's a a mound of earth that rose up, and so they cut their way into the side of the hill, and they just hollowed out a house. And you can understand, that's not really a house, is it? I mean, a hole in the side of a hill. Dirt walls, dirt ceiling, dirt floor, but they still had, you know, a little bed over there and a little mattress on the floor and and a little uh, cooking area of some kind and a a stove in the middle of it. And that was their first house, just a, a little cut out, carve out out of the side of the hill. And the coolest thing ever, you could stay in, in some cabins or you could put your own tent up or they rented these covered wagon type things. And so we rented one of those and we went in this covered wagon. There was a nice full-size bed up front, and then there were a couple twin beds along the sides and, and different things of that nature, and there were no restroom facilities or showers. That was in another building off to the side, but we got to stay there in that covered wagon. And I don't know if you've ever been to South Dakota, but it, the wind never stops blowing. I mean, I'm talking 30, 40 mile an hour winds just constantly. Shannon could not control her hair, no matter what she did. Uh, just wind blowing. And so we're in there in that, that covered wagon, and the wind is just blowing and howling. And then we hear the crack of the, th- the thunder and the lightning strikes, and it began to pour down rain. And we're in that covered wagon, and it was awesome. 
probably top five nights uh, spent out, out like that, and just absolutely incredible. Next day, we, we toured the area, and after they, they built a house eventually, we toured that house and so forth, and had a grand old time. Then we kept moving west, and we got to the Badlands, which I swear looks like the surface of Mars. I mean, there's just nothing like the Badlands of South Dakota. Uh, the, the coloring of, of the earth out there and the formations of the hills and different things like that. And then there's antelope just everywhere. Everywhere you look, it's not like, boy, I hope I get to see an antelope. It's like, is there anything out here but antelope? It's lousy with antelope, right? And uh, they're everywhere. Then we went to uh, the Mount Rushmore and saw that. And I'll tell you what, it's one thing to see a picture of it uh, or to see a YouTube video. But when you're there, that thing is gigantic. And it is super impressive and beautiful and pretty amazing. And we saw that. Then we drove this crazy uh, mountain road, Spearfish Canyon, Canyon, I think it was called. And we did all of that. And then once we left South Dakota, we made our way into Wyoming. We didn't quite have time to hit, uh, what's that called, Brent? Devil's Tower? Is that what it's called? We didn't have time to hit Devil's Tower, so we kept on cruising through, and we made it to Cody, Wyoming. And the first night in Cody, we went to the rodeo in Cody, and they had barrel racing and bull riding and bronc riding and it poured rain right before the rodeo then when the when the rain stopped there was this massive double rainbow in the sky it was like the lord just kept throwing amazing things our way as we did this trip and the next day we went and stayed at the absaroka ranch and we were going to do some horseback riding and so Shannon was going to sit out of the horseback riding. Me and the kids were going to do it. And so we go to sign up for it, and they're like, yeah, we got a horse for this little girl, and we got a horse for this little boy. Sir, we're going to have to see if we have a horse for you. And I thought, are you kidding me? Come on, man. These are horses, for goodness sakes. So they found a horse for me. And, you know, I'd, I'd ridden a horse way, way back in the day when I was much, much younger. Uh, the kids had never ridden a horse. But they told us, they said, these horses are very well trained and they are, you know, fully compliant with the rider. You just have to make sure that you steer the horse properly. And so we're looking and there's no steering wheel on the horse, right? There's no handlebars. What are we going to do here? Of course, rain. Right, The reins are around the horse's neck. And this lady that was teaching us how to ride these horses said, you barely have to do anything. First off, the, the trails we're going to be riding are, are mountain pass trails. They're only about a foot wide, if that wide. And there's really no place else to walk. You know, you're on the side of the mountain. And I'll tell you, it was pretty terrifying at times. You look to your left and there's a mountain. You look to your right and there's nothing. You look down and there's still nothing. It's just down there. So this horse better know what it's doing because I certainly do not. But they said, if you ever, you know, you need to give the horse some direction. And she said, especially when we're crossing creeks and riverbeds, you know, you really, you're going to have to give it some direction because the horse will be a little bit spooked, unsure of itself. And I thought, well, this is a perfect place to bring beginner riders, don't you think? And so we're, we're making our way. And she said, you know, you, you see on, on TV people pulling a rein really hard to the left or to the right. She said, you don't have to do anything like that. She said, just hold the reins, even with one hand, and if you just put a little uh, pressure on the one side of the neck, the horse will go that way. A little bit pressure on the other side, it'll go that way. You don't even have to pull it one way or another. Just let it know, let it feel the rein against its neck. Let it feel it slip just a little bit, and it'll go that way. And the reason that they'll do that is because at the end of the reins, there's a bit. And that bit has the rein attached to it on either side, and that bit is in the mouth of the horse. And so when you put a little pressure on one, one rein, you're actually pulling that bit ever so slightly. And that horse has no choice but to move its head in the direction that you're putting the pressure. And so it will walk in whatever direction it's looking. 
And so a little bit of pressure on the right side, that horse will look to the right, and it'll start walking to the right. A little bit of pressure to the left, it'll start looking to the left and then walk to the left. Bits in horses' mouths control their entire body. How much do you reckon a horse weighs? Some of them 1,200 pounds, some 1,600, some 2,000 pounds. When we were uh, doing a medieval-themed youth revival at our church in Georgia, we used to do some really high-production skits, and I wrote this skit called Robin Good and I can't say the rest of it because it's not politically correct anymore, and I even got in trouble back for that in 1999. So anyways, moving right along, Robin Good was our main character, and we had these villains, and uh, the villains came in, and, and, uh, and Robin Good was going to come and save the day. And I always let my pastor be the hero of the skit because that way he would kind of let me get away with more stuff. Uh, as long as he were the hero, right? So I, f I found a guy in our church named Glenn Easterwood, and I said, Glenn, I need a horse, but I need an, an impressive horse. I don't want just some little pony. In fact, you know, our pastor needs to ride on it. And so he said, we're going to need a big horse, then, aren't we? Anyways, uh, see how that works. <laughs> Maybe that's why I've reaped what I've sown in the past. But uh, he said, you know what? I've got a beautiful Belgian draft horse. And I think that she'll be good for this, you know, because we, we had, you know, we had lighting, we had music, we had spotlights and all kinds of stuff for these skits. And you got to make sure that the animal's going to be okay with it. So we had a full dress rehearsal Friday night. The services were going to be on Saturday. And uh, we pulled out all the stops during the dress rehearsal. And we had the horse there on property. And their auditorium was just like ours. We had a center section and two side sections and doors that you come in and then go back out of. And so our plan was to have the horse ride down down the aisle in one direction, come in front of the Lord's Supper table, and then our pastor would dismount, and then he'd do what he's going to do in the skit, and then he'd get back on the horse and ride out the other door. And so here we are, everything goes well. The horse is so tall that he couldn't even ride it into the auditorium. We had to walk the horse into the auditorium, then he had to mount it because the doorway wouldn't let him in on the back of the horse. That's how big this thing was. I know horses are hands tall. I don't know how many hands. Don't ask me. 30 hands. I don't know. Now that I just probably made it 40 feet tall. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so so we, we bring the horse down. He rides the horse down the aisle. He gets to the Lord's Supper table. He dismounts it. He's dealing with it. And then all of a sudden, we all hear running water. We're like, where is this running water coming from? Oh, our beautiful horse is urinating on the carpet of the church in front of the Lord's Supper table. This is a large horse. I don't know if you know how big a horse's bladder is. <laughs> I don't either. But the, the spot on the carpet was substantial. We'll just put it that way. But the good news is the horse did really well during all the skit and the music and the lighting and all that. And then we rode the horse out. And then we it used... We used a good number of towels to try to clean up that mess. I don't know what all that was about, but here, let's get back to the message. Uh, the bits in the mouths, right? 2,000-pound Belgian draft horse. How do you control that thing? Little piece of metal. Little rod of metal in the mouth of that horse. A ship's rudder does the same thing, doesn't it? How large is the rudder compared to the rest of the vessel? Just take a little fishing boat. You got a little fishing boat, you got a motor on the back of it, and that motor has a propeller and a little rudder. And all you got to do is turn that steering wheel just a little bit and that boat will start to turn. That rudder, I don't even know how to compare it. What percentage you compare? One one hundredth the size of the boat? Probably not even that big. One one thousandth? How about them big Great Lakes freighters that are out there that come up the St. Clair River and into Lake Huron? You know how they're controlled? Little rudder. No, it's not little. It's probably, I don't know, the size of that wall. But compared to the size of that freighter, it's nothing, is it? And the Bible says, just as that bit 
controls that horse and that rudder controls that ship, guess what controls your life? Your tongue. Your tongue will make or break your life. It's pretty incredible to consider, isn't it? Our tongues serve as both a bridle and a rudder for our lives. What we say and don't say can affect our lives. Our tongue determines our life, both good and bad. Have you ever had a time when you could have spoken up for someone and then didn't? When you should have spoken up for someone and then didn't? How about this? Have you ever had a time when you should have spoken up for yourself and didn't? How about this? Has there ever been a time when you opened your mouth and said something you shouldn't? Man, oh man. I have no lack of illustrations for saying things that I shouldn't say, especially when you're a preacher. Man, when you talk as much as I talk, you're bound to say something you shouldn't say. There was a man in our church in Georgia who was walking by my office, and I had just read in a book the story. And this was the story. It was written by, the book was written by a police officer. And he wrote a story about an accident. Uh, uh, an automobile was riding behind a semi-truck, and the driver of the car didn't see the truck stop, and so the car just kept going and went right under that bumper, that semi-trailer. And, of course, it came up over the hood and across the windshield, and it killed the young lady driving that car. And so the officer showed up to the scene and then the ambulance came and the EMT started getting out. One of the EMTs walked up to the automobile and then just broke down and lost it. It turned out that the young lady driving that car was that EMT, so their daughter. And they showed up on the scene for that. So this man in our church is walking by my office and I had just read that story and I thought, oh my God, goodness, this is incredible. And I said, hey, let me tell you about this story that I just read. And I told him the whole story. And the second I told him the ending, as I'm saying it, the Holy Spirit says to me, you idiot, don't you remember his daughter was just killed last month? If I had just told that story to anybody, we'd all be like, oh my goodness, that's incredible. But then tell it to somebody who just had that happen a month ago. I couldn't have been more stupid, more foolish, more thoughtless. And I've done it dozens of times. And I'm probably being generous to myself when I say dozens. I have a friend who pastors in Lakeview, Michigan, on the other side of the state by Lake Michigan, just north of Grand Rapids. He's a city guy, and he moved to the country. Lakeview has 1,000 people, approximately. Little country church comprised mostly of farmers. And he had just been called to the church one of his first few Sundays, and he's trying to get across the point how God can use anybody. And he says, take, for instance, Moses. Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh, and then he became a shepherd, and he's out watching the sheep. He's a farmer. He's just a dumb old farmer, old dumb Moses, the dumb farmer. And he keeps saying that over and over again. And uh, after the service was over, he's by the door shaking hands. People are leaving the service, and the first farmer to come up to him shook his hand and said, Preacher, sure was a good sermon. Of course, that's just coming from a dumb old farmer. He still pastors a church. They didn't vote him out for it. Those people are good enough to realize sometimes people say stupid things and preachers are people for the most part. And uh, sometimes preachers can say stupid things. And we've all done it. And you've done it too. You've said things to people to offend them, to upset them, to hurt them that were cold. Sometimes you do it on purpose because you're just trying to spite because you've got a wicked heart. Hmm? 
and it comes. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Peter said to the council, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so what comes out of here is a result of what's gone into here, you see. Let's go through our text here real quickly tonight. And by quickly, I mean hush. Just go with me. Verse 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren. So he's talking to Christian people here, right? Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Did your mother ever tell you that God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason? He wants you to listen twice as much as you're supposed to talk. Swift to hear, slow to speak. You ever been around the strong, silent type? The people that aren't talking all the time. In fact, they're pretty quiet. They usually just sit away and they take everything in. I don't think they're just the strong, silent type. I think they're the wise type. I think they're the obedient type. Swift to hear and slow to speak. And notice here, next, slow to wrath. That means they're not real quick to get angry. They don't lose their temper. They're, 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 they don't have a short fuse. However you want to justify it, right? They just aren't hasty in their reactions. In fact, we've taught in the past, and it's a better principle to act instead of react. Why do I have to react to everything? By the way, I don't know if anybody's told you this or not, but you don't have to react to everything in the news. Oh, what's that happen now? That's got to go on my social media. You don't have to comment on everything. You don't have to deal with everything that comes around. It's okay to let something go without having to put your two cents in. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? Verse 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. What he's saying is your hot temper isn't going to produce anything good for the Lord. Ah, that guy cut me off. I'm going to speed past him and shake my fist at him. And that's all you better do, by the way. I'm going to let him know what a jerk he is. And in the process, you'll be letting him know what a jerk you are. Huh? I hate to confess it, but there's a reason we don't have Lighthouse Baptist Church bumper stickers around here. Because I'm pretty sure you'd expect me to put one on my car, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. We made it all the way to Georgia and back. No speeding tickets. On the day after Thanksgiving. Man, Georgia state troopers were everywhere. Tennessee troopers, we saw about half a dozen of them. Georgia troopers, we probably saw 15 of them. Uh, and we're only in Georgia for 150 miles. That's one every 10 miles on average. It's pretty intense. Uh, Tennessee, probably five or six. Kentucky, about five or six. Then we got to Ohio. <laughs> Georgia thought they had a police presence. Then we got to Ohio. They had a police presence. Then we got to Michigan. Not one policeman anywhere. I'm in the promised land. Amen. But, uh, but uh, no speeding tickets. You'd be so proud. We better get going. Verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Superfluity is excessiveness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. As I read and studied this this week, I started to notice this comparison and contrast between our words and the word of God. It never jumped out at me like it did this week studying, but as we go through these verses, notice how God talks about our words and then his word. Guess which one should be in our mouths more often? Guess which one we should seek to get into our heart? Because if out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, best thing we can do is get this book into our hearts, isn't it? Because that's what we will speak of then. So let's look at it again. Receive with meekness. That's humility. You know, uh, you can't tell me anything. Yeah, we know. It's frustrating because you really need to listen. Uh, no, you know, I, I already know that. You know, it's that period of time when a kid turns about 14, 15, until they get to be about 25. A 10-year period of time where they know everything and their parents are dumb as rocks. But something happens in that 10 years and those parents, they learn an awful lot all of 
a sudden. It's incredible how God did that. Receive with meekness or humility the engrafted word, the word of God, which is able to save your souls. The Bible answers life's most important questions. Where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. The Bible is very clear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'll be honest with you, I just can't buy the evolution bit. I just can't do it. You can't tell me as I look around at everything that we have here and say, yeah, it's all just chance and happenstance. Seriously? I, I mean, your earth, this little marble you're on, with precision, rotates every 24 hours and has for thousands of years and it's never off. You think that's just chance? It revolves around the sun. And by the way, we've got to say this nowadays, right? It's not flat. By the way, the Bible speaks to that. The Bible says the sphere of the earth. The Bible's not a science book, but when it speaks scientifically, it's accurate. Revolution around the sun. Every 365 and one quarter days, it does that with precision. Shannon was taking pictures of the sunset as we were driving the other night through the Smokies. And just that orange sky. There's not, never been an artist like God. Your eyeball, your hearing your sense of smell and taste and touch, your nervous system. I mean, I'm up here gesturing wildly several times a week, and I, I rarely think about what I'm doing. I don't think to myself, okay, you're about to read from the Bible again. You better put your glasses on. I just do it. There's something going on up here that, you know, speaks to more than just chance. There's always got to be an origin story, doesn't there? He said, no, it was a great ball of matter that was hit with a great source of energy. Okay, where'd the matter come from? Where'd the energy come from? And the answer to that usually is, well, then where did God come from? He said, God exists outside of time, space, and matter. God created time, space, and matter. In the beginning, that's time, God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. God exists outside of our world, not within it. Where we came from, God. Why are we here? Well, we're here to fellowship with God, to get to know him, to find out what he wants us to do. He created us with a job in mind. Where are we going? I don't know. Where are you going? The Bible speaks of two places, heaven and hell. I was 15 years old. Somebody asked me, where are you going when you die? I said, I don't know. I hope heaven. They said, why do you think you hope heaven? I said, because God probably has a big scale up in heaven. And he's going to take all of my good deeds and he's going to put them on one side of the scale. You know, I'm talking an old school scale. He's going to take all of my bad deeds and put them on the other side. And if I can get my good to outweigh my bad, I think he'll let me in. And they said, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you've got more bad going for you than good. I said, well, what hope do I have then? They said, well, Jesus is our hope. That's why he died. I never understood why people who believe Jesus died to pay for their sins then think they also have to help him out with their good works. The Bible says... God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he died for every sin we would ever commit because he died before we were born. But God's omniscience, his all-knowing, knew we would be here and he sent his son to die in our place. Let's say Ashley is going to sell me a large pepperoni sausage pizza. And... She says, we got your pizza here, ready to go. And I say, you know, I just don't have the money to pay for it. But Dan Bard hears 
I got a pizza ready. And he says, you know what? I love my pastor. He's a good guy. I've known him for years. I want to help him out. And he drives by Domino's and he pays for my pizza. And then Ashley calls and says, hey, pastor, your pizza's ready to go. I say, yeah, but I don't have what it takes to pay for it. She said, somebody's already paid for your pizza for you. Wow. Who was it? I don't know, but he was ugly. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm just a jerk sometimes. Uh, I got a choice to make. I can say, you know what? If I don't have the money, I'm not taking the pizza. And you know what? I'll go without pizza. Or I can say, man, Dan is a good friend. And I love him and he loves me. And I'm going to accept his gift. And all I got to do is drive by and get the pizza. That's what salvation is like. That's what forgiveness of sin is like. We don't have what it takes to pay for our sins. So Jesus stepped in and paid for them for us. And all that's left for us to do is accept what he did and just say yes. And if we'll say yes, he'll forgive us and save us. And we'll have a home in heaven someday. All because of him and nothing to do with us. That's what that means there when it says to save your souls. Save your souls from what? Your sin and hell. It's good. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. He says, look, anybody can sit and listen to the word of God, but you need to take it a step further and do what it says. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. That's talking about a mirror. For be, he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You walk in front of the mirror in your bathroom in the morning and you say, ay, 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 we got to do something about this. And so we brush our teeth and we shave our face, you gentlemen, hopefully you gentlemen, not you ladies. Uh, you ladies moisturize and you put on the makeup. We wash our hair and we do our hair and we get ourselves looking the best we can. And then we walk away. And we generally don't think about what we look like after that. And there are people who look into the Bible and they see who they are. And then they walk away from it and they forget what God told them about themselves. And they don't make any change after that. That's what being a hypocrite is like. Saying you believe something, but then you don't live the life to back it up. What's the point? Why play the game? doesn't seem worth it. If you believe it, live it. And that's what verse 25 says. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's this book, and continueth therein, meaning you do the things that it says, he being not a forgetful hearer, I look at it and then I walk away and forget it, but a doer of the work, I actually do what I read. This man, the doer, shall be blessed in his deed. If I said, who in here wants to be blessed of God? Every hand to go. We just told you how to do it. Read the Bible. Do what it says. Verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious. Boy, that's like a gut punch to me. Yeah, you seem to be religious, but you're not. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. I told you that horse story for a reason. Well, not the one. He deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is in vain. You know what the Bible says? If you don't control your tongue, you have a vain religion. What does the word vain mean? Empty, hollow, shallow, non-existent. That's hard, isn't it? James doesn't play, by the way. Read the book of James. It's full of gut punches all the way through. If any man seem to be religious but bridleth not his tongue, his religion is in vain. That means if you can't control your mouth, any claim you make at being a Christian is empty and hollow. 
time. That's how people perceive you. They're a Christian. And we hear this all the time, don't we? It's a, it's a, it's a way to justify people's rejection of Christ. But if that's what being a Christian is, I don't want any part of it. Hmm? It got quiet in here all of a sudden. Where'd you all go? Pure religion. What is pure religion? And undefiled before God. And the Father is this. To visit the fatherless. How about we would call them orphans in another time, right? Kids who don't know where daddy is. Kids who don't know who their daddy is. Hello. To visit the fatherless. When's the last time you visited somebody who doesn't know who their dad is? When's the last time you were a blessing to them? Brought them some food. Took them out to McDonald's. Took them fishing. Spent some time with them. Took them to the mall. Hit Claire's Boutique. I don't know, is that still a thing, Claire's Boutique? Shannon doesn't know. I don't know. Visit the fatherless. Who else? Widows. When's the last time you cleaned a widow's gutters out for her? Mowed her lawn. Shoulder driveway. So we think... Pure religion's running our mouth. No, pure religion is serving people with needs. Bridling the tongue means to hold it back. You take those reins on a horse, and if it's at a full gallop, you pull back on them, what does that horse do? Stops. Why? That bit, that bridle. That bridle controls that horse's body. So when it says bridle your tongue, it means hold it back. It means don't say it. Probably 90% of the things we think we shouldn't say. I know that's true with me. I just tell it like it is. Yeah, nobody likes you either. I mean, we don't tell you that because we're not like you. Hello? Hello? I mean, we were like you. We'd tell you how terrible we find you. I better smile here. Uh, I just say what's on my mind. Be careful. You don't have a lot of it left. I just say what I think. Don't. That's what bridling your tongue is. Don't say what you think. And I've worked customer service in every possible way. Restaurants, retail. I've had people, because of their own ignorance of a product or, or service, tear into me. And to just sit there and listen to it and take it without retaliating. Sometimes it takes a lot to hold it back. But the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Maybe you've heard this old story. I'll tell it quick because we're running out of time. But supposedly some technical services guy on, on, for, for a computer company has this person call them and, and uh, they say, my computer isn't working. And they're like, well, power button on the front. Have you tried pushing it? And they're like, well, where's the power button? And they describe it to them. They finally find it. They push the power button. Yeah, nothing happens. Doesn't work. Was well, your monitor on too? I don't know. Does it have its own power button? Yeah, it does. Where is it? Get the power button on the monitor. Is the light glowing green? Yeah, it's glowing green. Is is the computer glowing? And then after spending 10, 15 minutes talking about it, the technical service person says, hey, could you do me a favor? Could you check and see if the computer's plugged in? And so they get behind the computer and they look and, oh, sure enough, it's not plugged in at all. And so the technical service person says, here's what I'd like you to do. Do you still have the box to your computer? Yeah, I do. Why don't you get the box out and get the computer and unhook it and, and put it back in the box, put the styrofoam back around it, seal the box up, and, and take the computer back to the store. Say, so, well, do you think there's something wrong with my computer? Oh, no, I don't think that at all. I just think you're too stupid to own a computer. <laughs> That's probably a case where the tongue should have been bridled. To bridle means to control. Let's look at one last passage and we're done. We're not even going to be able to talk about this, but we'll read it because that'll be enough. 
Chapter 3 of James, verse 1, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That means be careful if you want to be put in charge of something, because they're held to a higher accountability level. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. So the Bible says that if you can get through your life without offending anyone by what you say, you're perfect. There is nobody perfect, is there? And able also to bridle the whole body. Verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth, that means the rudder, directs the ship. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Have you ever had a fire that you started get out of control? I was burning, what was I burning? Limbs? Yeah, limbs, pine limbs with the needles still on them. And we'd cut them off and we'd let them dry out for a few weeks. And I put them on my fire pit. Because where I live, you can burn as long as it's in a fire pit. The trouble is, I forgot, my fire pit is right underneath of my big maple tree in my backyard. And so I put a couple branches on there and, you know, yeah, just a little gasoline to get it started. <laughs> Catches. Everything's fine. Not too much gasoline. I've seen those YouTube videos. And uh, they're burning. I'm like, man, let me just throw some more on. I start throwing them on and those needles just started catching and burning. Next thing I know, my fire is like 15 foot high. And then I realize... I'm burning under a tree. This is stupid. Not only that, some of you have been to my house, that tree is like eight feet from my garage and 10 feet from my house. And the branches of that tree overlay my garage and my house. And now I'm watching my nice green maple leaves on my healthy tree start to curl up and burn. And, and I start, I got my hose. I start spraying my fire down. Not out, but down. Because <laughs> I like to live on the edge. And uh, I thought, man, how close was I to catching this maple on fire, which would have then just took right off and burnt up my entire house. Imagine explaining that. Uh, Shannon, you should get the children and, and get out of the house. Why? What's going on? It's about to burn down. Get in the van and go to my parents' house. I'll meet the fire department here. What did it start with? One of them little Bic lighter things. Little flame. A little flame. Inch and a half high. Burn my whole house down. Thank the Lord it didn't happen. Could have. The Bible says that's what your tongue will do. Tiny little tongue. What happens? Destroy your marriage with it. You make your kids walk away from you and never come home again. Huh? You break your parents' heart. I hate you and I hate dad and I hate this house. You might want to stop and think before you say something like that. Hmm? How great a fire a little matter kindleth. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire. Look at here, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. The Bible doesn't speak to anything else like this. Oh, your finger is a fire, a world of iniquity. No. Oh, your ears are a world of iniquity, a fire. No. Your elbow, a world of iniquity. No. Tongue. The most dangerous part of your body is your tongue. 
so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. That's pretty strong language. What? Your tongue. So what should we do about it? I'd suggest getting the garden hose out. I'd suggest trying to put it out. How do you put it out? You bridle it. Next time you think, ah, no, never mind. I do that while I'm preaching sometimes. You've seen me do it. You've seen me also break it. Sometimes I'll say, I shouldn't say that. Oh, I'm going to say it. And I say it anyways. Then there are times when I say, I'm not even going there. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, a fool uttereth all his mind. That means that only fools say everything they're thinking. But a wise man keepeth it in till afterward. Afterward what? When nobody else is around. You don't have to say everything you think. By the way, you don't even have to say it just because it's the truth. Dear, does it look like I've lost any weight? Babe, you're beautiful every single day. Why do you have to say it? Don't. Well, they need to know. Well, you know what? Maybe God will get it through to them without using you. Bridle the tongue. I expect it'll be a lot quieter around here after this sermon. <laughs> In a minute, Brother Dix is going to come to the piano and we'll all stand like normal. And I'll pray and then we'll open the invitation. And if you have something you need to talk to the Lord about, feel free to come down the aisle, kneel at the altar. Nobody will bother you. You know that. Nobody's going to come to you. Nothing like that. But you come and do business with God. Maybe you need to confess some sin and say, God, I talk too much. I say things that I shouldn't say. I say things to people that I shouldn't say to them. I talk about people behind their back. I'm critical, I'm negative, I gossip, and I don't want to be that way anymore. Help me bridle my tongue. There's a guy named Dave Ramsey, and you may know of him. He's a Christian financial advisor. He has a rule in his company, no gossip. If you're caught gossiping in his company, they fire you. He says gossip is a poison that will destroy anything it invades. It's a cancer, and it is. You know what we're told to do for one another? Love each other. Encourage each other. Edify each other. And you can't do that when you're running people down, burning them with your tongue and your words. So maybe you'll come and kneel tonight and ask God to forgive you. Maybe you've been working on it. Maybe you're doing well, and maybe you've made some progress. Come and ask God to help you keep growing. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never had a chance to put your faith in Christ. To ask him to forgive you of your sins and to save you and take you to heaven when you die. I was 15 when I did that. My dad was in his middle 30s when he did it. My kids were only like 8 or 9 years old. My wife was in her early 20s when she did it. Doesn't matter how old you are. What matters is that you accept Christ as Savior. Our sins are what's keeping us apart from God. But they don't have to. Christ died on the cross so that we can be forgiven of those things. If you're here tonight and you're not 100% sure you're on your way to heaven, come down the aisle and pray and ask God to forgive you and save you. If you think like you need a little help or a little counseling with it, let me know. I'm available. My wife's available. We can take the Bible and show you exactly what God says about it. But don't leave here tonight and not know for certain you're on your way to heaven. Let's stand together, please. Father, help us tonight. Not a person in this room doesn't need help with what we talked about, myself included. I have said more stupid, foolish, and even hurtful things than I care to admit. Father, forgive me for it. Help me to use my tongue properly and right. Help me to say things that build people up and not tear them down. 
I pray the same thing for all of us here tonight. Would you please speak to our hearts and work in our invitation, please? We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The piano plays. The altar is open. You come. If the Holy Spirit spoken to your heart, just move on that first note. Don't let the devil talk you out of coming. Come and do business with God tonight. Thank you for your attention tonight. You may be seated. Ushers, would you come forward? Can we receive our offering at this time, please? Thank you very much. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. We did hit budget last week. I'm certain of it based on what we saw come in through online. But because of the holiday and, and being out of town, we didn't count the offering yet. But I'm sure that we made budget. We'll let you know next week the combination of the two. Brother Rick, would you please pray? Vicki wants to complain about the temperature in here, but how dare she after that message? She can't possibly do it, right? She would be complaining, and we would all say, see there, empty religion. It's vain. No, I'm just picking on you. <laughs> all right, let me see. I'm just going to give you a couple of announcements for the sake of time. Uh, one, we are trying to put care packages together for three of our military men, Tyler Sharber in the Navy, Joshua Sharber in the Marines, and Ben Dix in the Army. So please see Jeanette tonight or get in touch with her today or, or tomorrow or Tuesday. But by Wednesday, we need to have everything to her that we're going to get her so she can put these together and get them sent so they arrive in time for Christmas. Ben is in Colorado. Tyler's in California, right? And then uh, Josh is down in D.C., I imagine, the uh, military kind of does something, you know, inspection or something like that. So they, it probably has to go through a process. So we don't want to delay this. So if you would, please see her. We ought to be good to these young men. They're uh, serving our country and, and dedicating a portion of their lives to do so. We ought to express our love to them. That's number one. Uh, number two is the ladies conference at Belleville, Michigan is this coming Friday and Saturday. Please see Shannon Stiff if you're interested in going or if you've already planned on going. We need to get all the logistics together now and make sure that that's taken care of, all right? And then the final thing is I need some of your help, young men. Uh, let's see, Ashton, I need you and I need Charles and I need Isaiah. And Brother Rick, would you help those three guys? 
Ashley has canned goods in her car, and we just need to get those down into the kitchen. Could you oversee those three young men and, and help them with that? In fact, if you guys want to do that now, Ashley, we'll, let, we'll cut you loose, and Brother Rick and you guys that I just called, you guys go ahead and leave out this door here, and you'll be able to find it. Ashley and Bubba, thank you guys for being here and being our guests tonight. I hope I haven't embarrassed you by talking about you publicly so much. It's a bad habit I have. I don't know how to control my tongue. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> good, good. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Appreciate you guys and the work you're doing. Even the fact that you just make pizzas warms my heart. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Ashley. That's awesome. All right. Uh, I think that's all we need to do, right? Questions, cares, concerns, quandaries, conundrums. Are we good? Pray for Bob. He's trying to get his surgery tomorrow. Uh, he's gone in twice before, and he's just his his heart rate and blood pressure have not been uh, adequate for surgery, and so they they've just admitted him, and then he's stuck there for three or four days. We'd like to see him be able to have the surgery tomorrow. It'll be the third time. Normally, they're in Florida by now, enjoying the sun and the palm trees. Don't let that keep you from praying for him, all right? <laughs> but we love you, Bob and Janet, and we want to see that surgery go in, into action and then it to go well. So please pray for that, would you? All right, let's stand. We'll pray and be dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight and your attention tonight. Father, we love you. Help us to do as was preached tonight and as we see in these two chapters of James. May we bridle our tongues and be wise with the words we use. Father, we pray for Bob tomorrow. Would you let him be able to get this surgery? Now, we don't want him to get it if it, if it would be a, a risky situation. But we'd like him to be stable enough and the blood pressure right so that he can get it. Please allow that. And then let the surgery go as planned. And let it, him come through it with no issues or, or problems whatsoever. And then we pray for a good recovery, and uh, we pray your blessing on Janet and Bob and their home and their family, please. In fact, would you please bless each and every home and family here as we head into the season where we celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus. May we keep you preeminent in all facets of our lives. Help us to not crowd you out to try to fit celebration in. Help us to remember why we celebrate. Please keep us safe as we head home and bless your people. We love you and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.